If you give me a moment, we are uh, ready for our keynote speaker. Uh, t today, I think you've met already Carolyn Lukensmeyer. She's executive director of the National Institute on Civil Discourse. <clears throat> and she's ha had uh, decades of experience in deliberative democracy, used to run America Speaks, uh, has probably put on more deliberative panels than anybody we can think of, and uh, is now. Uh, moved over to focus more on civil discourse. Last uh, November, when I spoke to Carolyn and asked her if she could do this, she was working on a project involving civil discourse at holiday meals. And I don't know if that's part of your presentation, but she was very busy with that, and uh, business is, is robust these days. Uh, please welcome Carolyn Lukensmeyer. Thank you very much, George, and uh, I'm delighted that I could come this morning. There's always been real colleagueship between civic public journalism and deliberative democracy, so I've actually run into some old friends here today that I wouldn't have thought about. This, I, when George invited me, I actually pushed back a little bit, and I said, well, you know, in terms of what I'm doing now, it doesn't have quite as direct a connection to civic journalism as the way I was working previously. But the link that is there, and that I will try to touch stone on several times, is the issue of narrative. And the way I've talked about this for almost 20 years is that one of the ills of our society today, and this is not new, is the gap between the national narrative in the country and the narrative of what's actually happening all over this country in our communities. And the national narrative, by definition, and earlier speakers gave you lots of the reasons why, focuses dominantly on the conflict model and dominantly feeds us pretty negative stories about who we are and what we're doing. And unfortunately, in terms of mass media and mass psychology, when you hear a consistent narrative over time, even if it doesn't agree with the narrative that you have access to, you begin to believe the narrative. And then sometimes what starts as a narrative early on that isn't factual due to, and I'm going to underline several times what Margot said, that structural issues are usually what create the conflicts that then take place at the human behavior level. And when we can't deal with the big structural issues, we then start to hold individuals responsible for why they are behaving the way they're behaving. If we want to take the most dramatic example, in my opinion, in the US today, it's the opioid crisis. We've spent 20 plus years blaming the addicts, blaming the individuals. Now finally, we're shining some light on the intentional strategies of specific drug companies, which I lived in Ohio for 20 years, 24 years. You can name communities in Ohio, 5,000 people, 7,000 people, who were having delivered to their local pharmacies and other retails at the level of 10 to 12,000 pills a week. That's a systemic issue. That's not people who are out of jobs so desperate that they actually intend to become drug addicts. But we mix up the narratives. In the current situation that I'm going to talk about, hyperpartisanship. Hyperpartisanship was embedded in the Congress in this country very intentionally by a lot of big money and several other things as well, which I'm not going to spend a lot of time going into. But about five or six years ago, the media began to ask the question, is it Congress that's driving hyperpartisanship, or is it members of the public who are driving Congress to be hyperpartisan? There is no question. The kind of hyperpartisanship we're starting is centered a few miles in that direction. Unfortunately, the way in which that led to incivil discourse has now embedded itself in the public. But for the cause and effect, 
it started systemically. And then we have begun to bring it into our neighborhoods, homes, etc. So I'm really just going to share with you the kind of work that we do. And I, I'll take a minute, because some of you may or may not know this. The National Institute for Civil Discourse was created at the University of Arizona in 2011. It opened about five months after Gabby Giffords was shot in that mass shooting. And I imagine every person in this room will remember that that time around, we thought it was going to be different because it was a member of Congress. And there was Newtown. We thought it was going to be different that time because it was innocent kids. Hope to gosh, and I again applaud several people on the panel who acknowledge that we are seeing something different now with the way in which young people not only have really stepped up, and I'm going to come back to that a little later, but they are being supported in being stepped up. We have their backs in a way we haven't done before. But the university and the community of Tucson came together very, very quickly after Six people died, including a 10-year-old girl, you may remember this part of the story, who specifically asked her mom to take her to the congressman on a corner because she loved Gabby. And at 10 years old, she already knew she wanted to run for Congress someday. So six people died, 13 were wounded. Gabby Giffords, I'd never heard of her. I'm not like a lot of the politically ignorant. I do know the branches of Congress, and I do blah, 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 blah. But I'm sure most of you have no idea the names of members of the House of Representatives that aren't your own district or aren't your own issues. But I paid attention to it, and I really did take a look at who she was and what she'd done. She was highly respected. She was first in the state legislature in Arizona, highly respected for her bipartisan work and for her knowledge about how politics works when it's working right. Politics at the top is an understructured organization. People come in and out every two, four, six years. In understructured organizations, relationships are more important than in highly structured organizations. Because the only way you get work done is people trust you. Gabby was known for her, her real bipartisanship, not just in passing bills, but in building relationships. When she came to DC, same thing. She was one of three women that started the women's softball team in the House of Representatives. And I could give you lots of examples. Frankly, she is a treasure to this day. Doctors have said that the kind of injury she's had, as far as she has progressed, they never believed it could happen, both in terms of paralysis and in terms of the link between her thought part of her brain and her speech part of her brain. If she hadn't been shot, as sure as I'm standing here, and I don't often make statements like this, she would either today be in the Senate from Arizona or she would be the governor of Arizona. So the charge that came to us at the <laughs> National Institute was make something good come out of this horrible tragedy. I took the position uh, for about a year and a half, there was an interim director, and U of A is one of the premier research institutions in the United States. And they spent a year and a half doing nothing but research. What is civility, incivility? What are the leverage points for influencing it? And I was headhunted to come from all the practical work I'd done in social action to put some meat on the bones about, OK, we now understand this. We actually see what some of the leverage points are. What can you do about it? When I started, I can tell you, no matter where I went, could have been public, could have been a church, could have been an academic situation, or situation or media for sure, there was always a pushback. What's the definition of civility? Aren't you just trying to make me be nice? Well, what a sea change in five years. Nobody asks now what the definition of civility is other than for a research academic reason. You can't go through a day in the United States of America without seeing the word civility in your newsfeed, probably from all four mediums. So we've gone from people being pretty, you know, that's too big a word or it's not a meaningful word to this is, we're living in this. OK, we collect political cartoons in our office. And this is, frankly, one of our favorites. 
civil discourse on a gurney into the way to the emergency room with a clear question mark. Will it survive? You know, we were talking here at our table. One of the blessings our founders built into our basic documents was the expectation of conflict, the expectation of difference. And by definition, it means democracy is a conversation. It is the quality of that conversation that is what is essential. We did this, uh, Scott Stanton um, <coughs> is a very conservative political common, uh, cartoonist from the Chicago Tribune. And I love to use this one because one of the real dangers in any parent of young children began in the early in 2016 presidential primaries of the concern parents had about, well, how do we even let our children be exposed to this at this point? Because what's being role modeled is that the way you treat each other is what you see there. Fairfax County, not too far from where we're standing. As you all know, one of the best school systems in the United States of America public. Literally, the very week that Donald Trump first attacked Muslims in the primary campaign, that very week, Re um, recess monitors reported to teachers and to parents eventually that little white kids on the playground in third grade were bullying little brown kids saying, if, Tr if Trump's elected, you won't be here. Less than a week that began to be absorbed in terms of how children learn to think about what is appropriate behavior. Um, this is a structural issue. A lot because of gerrymandering and the way primaries now bring people out. Why we had been so successful for coming up with compromise solutions was the 435 members of the House and 100 members of the Senate. There was a lot of overlap. There were some conservative Republicans, liberal Republicans, conservative Democrats, liberal Democrats, who actually agreed on specific issues despite the disparity in the ideology. We are now sitting in a circumstance in both chambers in which there is no overlap whatsoever in terms of ideology. That's the structure, one of the structural issues. I'm going to give you quick, three quick slides. About six weeks ago, we got a call in our office from the president of the American Psychological Association. I don't know if we have any mental health workers in the room, but they, mental health workers have been reporting consistently since 2016 that people are coming to their offices still sitting with issues of anxiety that are serious enough they feel they need professional help. This stress survey, I have to look this up again because I've forgotten <laughs> how many years the APA has done this stress survey, but this year, the first time ever, Current political climate hit, I believe it's 57%. They'd never seen it before. This year, that showed up. And why APA contacted us is they said, you know, we've got members all over the nation who are dealing with this anxiety based on that cause. And we're wondering if you have tools, discussion guides, suggestions for how to's. So we have just signed a memorandum of understanding with the APA in which we will be working with them to bring all this material to their members. I'm going to take a couple of minutes, you know, most of the narrative, and it's an accurate narrative, about the difference in our generations, baby boomers, Generation X, millennials. And I, what's the new name for the ones younger than millennials? I? Okay, thank you. I haven't quite absorbed that one yet. In most survey data, there are huge differences in perspective, particularly between millennials and baby boomers in terms of how they feel about an issue. This question is, what would you name, or they give periods of history, what would you name as the lowest point in our nation's history? 59% of all respondents chose right now. So, People of my age, would, we would think, would have chosen World War II, would have chosen whatever, whatever. But here's why I put this in. This is really important data. It doesn't matter if you're over 72 or if you're 
in the big baby boomer generation, or if you're a Gen Xer, or if you're in the largest generation of all of us, the millennials, they all picked that as the worst point in history at about the same level. I'm not seeing Richard right now, but he was very wise about actually challenging us around what's our attitude about where we are and how much despair do we have about where we are. And again, you all know some version of the social sciences work that demonstrates, yes, there are these reality conditions that are really bad. But the fact is how I feel about those reality conditions can in fact make them worse or better. I think it was Hamlet that sort of gave us that clue to begin with. Nothing is but thinking makes it so. So I think, you know, this is something we all need to take pretty seriously. Okay, again, I'm only going to do, my goal with you is a little bit of how we got here and then frankly to share a lot of specifics that I think are very hopeful. Things really to grab onto and I'm actually going to try if I can pull it off in time to do something with you that we have done already with elected officials, not as many journalists but some, and a huge number of ordinary Americans all across the country to just have a taste of it in the room if I have enough time. So there are others besides these, but in terms of people who look at this seriously in our political world, structural issues about how we got here. Too much money in politics, gerrymandering. I didn't happen to put the primaries where you know, don't forget a huge reality about the United States. 40% of us who are eligible to vote in every cycle do not vote. And that number has held steady for many decades. I think one of the most interesting structural solutions that's beginning to bubble up, both in terms of pundits in Washington, and we're hearing it from people in the country, Maybe the U.S. should do what Australia and 38 other countries do, that we actually should require. It should be universal suffrage. We have to have driver's licenses. We have blah, blah, blah. Why not make it an actual responsibility? Australia's system is you, if you don't vote, you pay a $50 fine or spend a night in jail. That's been true since 1981 or 80. The only change in that law since then, and I think it's a wise, wise change, was they began to get a lot of pushback from people who said, you know, I don't vote because you're not giving me a choice I believe in. I don't think either one of these people should run this country. So what they've done is added to their ballots in all the significant races, vote for A or B or I don't vote for either of these people. <coughs> And they're now operating above 95% of people voting on a regular basis. It's about 98% in local elections. 24-7 news cycle definitely is a big problem. I served as chief of staff to the governor of Ohio in the late 80s. Whether it was when the Ohio River flooded and we already knew people were dying, or whether, I can't remember at the moment, a big, oh, it was the banking crisis. How could I forget? The governor had time to think. The governor had time to talk to the key people who were most significant on the issue on both sides before he was expected to put out a position about where he was going to go. Now the microphone's in your face, as you said, and if you don't have an answer, you will pay. So no time to think. It's almost all reaction. Social media without question, without question has degraded the quality of our discourse, whether we look at it was bullying in high schools that have led to suicides, if you want to be dramatic, or to me, the one that just broke my heart was after Parkland. Look at what happened to the leadership, and they were wise about how to respond back. But it was not just people who were using social media completely inappropriately. It got into the same bot system that was playing around in our election. So we're, so when something a word that hasn't gotten used this morning that I think is really important. When something clearly authentic bubbles up, either from the top or from the grassroots, those are precious moments in life. Those are the moments that should be determining narrative. 
and the way in which our media system has changed, the capacity to attack those authentic moments and try to delegitimate them is faster than you can blink an eye. If I were, if I were in the media world, I, you want to have antitrust, I think you're right, we should do that. But deep, deep work in terms of what can be brought in to do some moderation, to do some controls on how these, this technology is used is, we're crying <coughs> for it. Okay. If you don't remember anything else that I talk about today, <laughs> I hope this sinks in in some way that matters to you. Human beings are social beings. We are incredibly responsive to the context we're in, the structure we're in, and the signals we are receiving in that context. The last project America Speaks ran was on our debt and deficit in 2010. We had 3,500 demographically representative people in America, including ideology, sitting in 19 cities across the country, and they together cut $26 trillion out of the U.S. deficit by the year 2025. In the morning when they started, the self-identified conservative said, under no circumstances will I do anything to raise revenue. And you know the second half of the sentence I'm going to say. The liberals all said, and we won't do anything to cut entitlements. All, both of them, 86, 87 percent. It takes about a, a bright fourth grader, about 30 minutes at looking real data that's in their scope, to figure out you can't solve the U.S. deficit without both raising revenue and cutting spending. This happened to 3,500 people who spent seven hours deliberating with it, with people at the same table diametrically opposed when they started in the morning. When I testified, to the Senate Budget Committee, the House Budget Committee, and the President's Fiscal Commission. You could look this up on YouTube. I'm sure it's still there someplace. I literally said, this is what happened on July or June 10th or whenever it was. These people solved this problem, $26 trillion out of the deficit. But if we could put a chip in their little finger, <clears throat> come November, when they vote in the midterm again, they will have watched weeks and weeks of dumbing down campaign ads with the Republicans all driving no revenue, the Democrats all driving no entitlement. And they'll revert to form. They had a profound experience that many of them called transformative. But when they go through that process in that context, out of all the safeguards and supports that were built into what we did, they'll revert to form. OK. The most dramatic, um, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say one more thing about this. What, the way Parkland came up this morning, and I chatted with Margot about this, it's beautiful what those young people are doing. But you know, some long form, real investigatory journalism should now take two recent events in the United States and dig deep into how Parkland young people have gotten all the support they've gotten, aside from what happened on social media. And the second story is Ferguson. There was an equally number, maybe, probably not as large a number, but a very large number of young black people in Ferguson and surrounding communities who behaved exactly the same way at the beginning as the kids in Parkland did. But they got treated very differently. And what part, the way the media focused on it was completely different. Some of those same kids, we actually worked with some early, and I'm, I'm thinking you'd be a perfect person to be related to this possibility of some of those kids got criminalized. What would it be? If we could bring, say, 20 of those kids from Ferguson that played that role, and 20 of these kids from Parkland sometime a few months from now, put them in a room together, well designed, and let them explore what happened to one. And we all know the big what happened to one, but it needs to be dealt underneath besides the race issue. OK. Um, our mission, to bring people together for civil conversations to find common ground on divisive issues. We basically all research-based and try to contribute back to research. 
We work with elected officials, the public, and the media. And when we can, we bring the three of them together, working on the same issue at the same time, which is very powerful. I'm going to do this very quickly. The most, uh, the program we've been able to embed the furthest, and I often say, particularly when I'm raising money, if we couldn't do anything else, this program should be pr preserved. We've now worked in 16 states. We require three things before we go to work. Leadership in the state legislature has to agree to do it. It has to be the appropriate number of Democrats and Republicans. And there has to be ahead of time at least part the part-time of one staff member's responsibility to ensure someone is driving the action agenda when the work is finished. So every single state we've worked in, except Arizona, I have to say, and we had a very important thing happen there, but it's not the end of the sentence. In every state except Arizona, legislation has passed because of the relationship that was built between the people who went through the workshop we do called Building Trust Through Civil Discourse. I've, I don't lead these. One of the insights that I had very early on was that if we were going to do this work, it should be led by legislators themselves. Being an elected official in this country is a really unique experience. And in the ways we think about how poorly they're performing their jobs, how they often mistreat the public, well, think about how the public treats them. So they, the sense of trust and the sense of credibility I knew would be much, much higher if they started out with leadership. So we've now trained about 85 Republican and Democrat members of state legislature or some formers who, when we go into a new state, the last state we did was Delaware. I don't remember exactly where all the facilitators were from, but Minnesota, Pennsylvania, Vermont, Ohio. So we pair a Republican and a Democrat from two different states. They lead the workshops. So another sign of hope. We are intensely working in four states in the United States. We're a small organization. Resources, of course, are limited. So we pick states for very specific reasons. Maine, Ohio, Iowa, and Arizona. Politically, culturally, geographically, extremely different. Ohio, Iowa, key states. Maine we pick because in Maine, we've gotten to one of our real targets about doing this work. A local organization in Maine is now funding this work completely so that virtually every new legislature that comes in goes through this process. That's where we'd like to get in all states. So when we did the first workshop in our current initiative called Revive Civility and Respect, and this is what I'm going to do a little bit with you if you tell me I have time. One point in the evening, we ask people to pick someone to have a conversation with that ordinarily you would be very unlikely to talk to. And in this case, I didn't know it at the time, but the two gentlemen who picked each other, the Democratic chair of the, uh, the chair of the Democratic Party in Lincoln County, the chair of the Republican Party in Lincoln County. They knew each other, had rarely talked. They discovered they really kind of liked each other. And they agreed to have lunch the next week. And at that lunch, they agreed, Maine is going to have a horrific 2018 gubernatorial election. I don't know if any of you pay attention to Maine politics, but Maine had a Trump for governor before Trump was on the scene. So anyway, Chris and, and Bill decided that they would go to their committee men and women, who you all know are really partisan people in our political system, and see if they could agree on a set of standards that they would expect candidates campaign consultants and media coverage to abide by when they were in Lincoln County. And they've been doing that. NICD offered, and knock on wood, I think this is going to happen, that we would come back to Maine. And it's easier to do in Maine than Ohio. Ohio has 88 counties. Maine has 16. So we've agreed that we will come back and design the meeting for these two gentlemen to propose to all of the other county chairs in Maine to do the same thing in all 16 counties. I think that's a very hopeful sign. In Congress, I bet you, I'm almost, I'd, I would almost be willing to bet money, which I never do. How many of you knew that 46 of the new freshman members, 
last January, signed a commitment to civility in their first week in office. It, of course, got no media coverage. <laughs> when we heard about it, we immediately sent out letters to the editor and op-ed pieces to the newspapers of every one of their communities. And we now track these people, and we send them attaboys and attagirls when they do something positive. And when they do something against what they wrote, we send little notes, not publicly. We're not into shaming. We are into influencing. No, this doesn't look like what you signed. So two of these members, and this, um, this is too fuzzy for me to read. <laughs> it's a very strong statement. The first, par the first larger paragraph, this one, literally says, vitriolic political rhetoric has created a profound distrust in the American people in the institutions of government, and we have to do something about it. This is no pablum. Two of the members, Charlie Crist, a Democrat from Florida, and Mike Johnson, a Republican from Louisiana. Mike was, you know, like if you think of the De Declaration of Independence, Mike has kind of a special place in this group because he basically wrote the statement. It was then edited and supported by a very liberal Democrat, a woman from South LA, who I'm embarrassed at the moment, I'm not grabbing her name. Anyway, Mike and Chris, and Chris, Charles Christ have now gotten a total of 121 members in the House of Representatives to sign this statement, and they have started a new caucus called the Honor and Civility Caucus. I highly recommend that you check out your own members. If you discover that they have signed this and are participating in this, send a note not just to them, but to their press secretaries about how happy, proud you are that they have done this, and is there anything you can do to help. If you discover your member hasn't joined it, then send the message which says, do you know about this? We, in the 52 people who are in my party club, would think it would be a very good idea if you joined. Okay, so that's hope on the elected official side. One other thing I should say, we have signed a memorandum of understanding. There's a subset of the US Conference of Mayors called Mayors for Innovation. And many of them are signing proclamations. I don't know how many of you worked in politics, but proclamations come into the office all the time. And it takes about two minutes for the mayor or the governor to sign it, and probably an hour for somebody to write it. And that's that. But NICD has put together a package of tools to go with the proclamation. So if the mayor of, and most recently, uh, the mayor of Augusta, Maine, has done amazing things. Um, Frankfort, Kentucky's mayor is just about to sign on to this. So their staff, who is always underpaid and underworked, or overworked, who don't have much time to do the steps afterwards of programming to go with the proclamation, we're saying, you do the proclamation. We'll help you with the program. OK, with the public. Uh, I told you the deep dive. We now have, I think it's 111 national and local partners. Why? Because we're a small organization. We want, oh, sorry. We want AARP. You may have noticed that their CEO has written several columns that are fantastic on civility. So at the right time, we want them to send a message to their 55 million members, dot, 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 this is something you can do. So all the way from AARP to a great organization that we worked with in America Speaks for years called the West Virginia Center for Civic Life. It is a highly trusted organization. They've done deep community dives in which hundreds of thousands of West Virginians are acknowledging that coal is dead and are looking toward a new economy. So this is serious work. Okay. So if any of you represent organizations that want to join this partnership in this work, give me a card before I leave. So we bring together one-on-one -on -one conversations, small group conversations, a texting platform I'm going to tell you about, and large community organ um, events. The whole point, I, I left out something that's very important here. I'm going to back up to say. We decided to start this Revive Civility initiative in about March of 2016. Because NICD, which is not a very well-known, I mean, truth and truth and labeling. How many of you had ever heard of this organization before you came here today? Five. 
That's probably because you knew me from someplace else. <laughs> so, you know, we're not exactly a household name. But it means people were concerned enough about this that they were scanning the web for, is there some place that might have help? We got thousands of social media messages, email messages, and even some phone calls. And these days, people don't pick up the phone to say the verb was always different. I'm embarrassed, I'm frustrated, I'm ashamed, I'm angry. But the end of the message was almost always similar. The end of the message was a note. You can almost see them shrug their shoulders kind of throw up their hand. But what can we do? Well, my own original academic background is I had a foot in two camps very deep, political science and psychology. In both of those academic streams, there would be a theoretical way of looking at those messages. A political scientist would read them and say, oh my god, that person lacks a sense of agency. They feel like they can't make anything happen. Therefore, they are likely to disengage. They're likely to leave the public square. With the psychologist's perspective, any time a human being has been evoked, an emotion has been evoked strong enough to send a message to someone they don't know, it means it's in their system. And that emotion has to go someplace. And they would describe, depending on the person's life experience and their resources and their personality style, if it continues to agitate them, it's most likely to end up in inappropriate anger or one style or in depression in another style. So we were highly motivated. This is in 2016, the middle of that election. Full well knowing we couldn't do anything about what was happening in that national scene. But what we did know was we could be helpful in terms of think only about your sphere of influence. Think about what's happening where you are located. We taught people how to write op-ed, things that would happen other places. We taught people how to call television producers when they saw some. Anyway, every week we put out an action. This is something you can do. So sometime, I would say September, I said to my board, you know, look at the response we're getting to this, which was terrific. And I said, you know, given how this is all going, I think it doesn't matter who wins. There's going to be a division left in this country that we have to keep this work up and see if we can't scale it up. And I want to, a couple of you I was talking to on breaks already heard me say this. We got way more messages after the election. And not just from people on the left. They came from family members. Um, for Thanksgiving, we got a call from a very distraught mother in New England who said, we have two brilliant daughters, one's at Mount Holyoke and one's I've forgotten where. They have not spoken to each other since the election. They're both coming home for Thanksgiving. Can you help? We got calls from a surprising number of faith-based leaders, Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, and even a couple of imams. The message was something like this. I've been the leader of this congregation for 30 years. We are a very harmonious community. We do things together. We live together. We don't just pray together. This is now several months after the election. We are split. People sit on opposite sides of the aisle. People don't come to our social events anymore. The biggest surprise to me is we actually have gotten calls from major U.S. corporations with exactly the same question. We have product innovation teams. I think, what are we now, what are we, 18 months past the election? It's a year and a half. We, are, we have product innovation teams who have not come back to the same level of productivity that they were at before the election. Now, I'm just going to state the obvious. Product innovation teams are that corporation's bottom line 5 to 10 to 15 years from now. So this is a serious situation. We then began to do a little research and, in fact, found that political historians in this country, whether they tend to lean ideologically to the right or to the left, all agree that this level of antipathy between ordinary Americans has not happened in this country since Jim Crow post-Reconstruction. 
and think just in our own lifetime. 2000 was a highly contested election. Same outcome, electoral went one way, popular went the other way. And I'm sure there were millions of Democrats in the country that never gave George W. Bush, if I could make a funny aside personal comment, they'd probably all like to have him back now. But at any rate, <laughs> delete that from this. <laughs> anyway, the bottom line is ordinary people are still, a year and a half later, vilifying, demonizing, otherizing, and actually holding the actual emotion of hate and fear about the other. So we believe at this point that, and if you look back for a little while now, all these two-term presidencies, we've just been on a pendulum swing. For eight years, the Dems get it. For eight years, the Republicans get it. For, and nothing gets done. Not nothing, but not as much as should get done. Now this virus is in us. Now it is not just hyperpartisanship a few miles down the road. So if we don't work as a society to do something that enables us once again to have an actual conversation for understanding rather than for advocacy, we're going to be in this mess for a very, very long time. And that's what we do in our initiative. We basically Give people the skills. How do you have a conversation? And we, it, sometimes it's as basic, you voted for Hillary and I voted for Trump. And blah. so how do the two of us sit long enough that what happens at the end, you learn enough about my life experience and what was rational to me to make the choice I made, and I learn enough about you. And what we're finding, I'll, I will again go to the Ohio example. We do this where the whole thing is who are we and how do we talk to each other? And at the end of it, people are chomping at the bit. People are saying, okay, now let's take on a real issue. In Arizona, it's always immigration first or the wall. In Maine, it's refugees or conservation. In Ohio right now, it's usually opioids. Because again, there's a partisan split about is it self-responsibility or is there a social issue that should be dealt with? OK, so that's what's happening in these conversations. Do I have time to show a four-minute video? This is a video done by the preeminent gay rights activist in the state of Iowa and the gentleman who was the policy director for Ted Cruz's presidential campaign. You don't need to know any more about either one of them to know that no matter ever in their lives, Will they come to any shared view of what gayness is and how gay people should be treated? And this is the story that you're going to hear. Well, a friend of mine passed away, and she was all about reconciliation, always about reaching out to people and to unlikely people. When she passed away, I wanted to do something to honor her. And I thought, who would be the most unlikely person on the planet that I would reach out to. And it was Bob. Well, I'm the president and CEO of the Family Leader. And our mission statement is to strengthen families by inspiring Christ-like leadership in the home, the church, and government. I'm the executive director at One Iowa, which is the state's largest lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender organization. Uh, I've been an activist and an advocate and sometimes an agitator in this movement for almost 30 years. What well, Wadana and I, we see the world very differently uh, in our view on marriage, on sexuality, and probably on a host of a lot of other issues. I guess you'd have to say that my impression of Bob was not only he was the opposition, he was the enemy. Uh, I've probably made statements about her and her organization in the press. She's probably made statements about me and my organization in the press. We, we weren't natural allies. We weren't natural coffee buddies. And so she emailed the family leader and said, hey, I talked to Bob, and Bob said he'd be willing to do coffee. Let me know a good time of day. And so they shared that email with me like, uh, is this true? I mean, is this real? And I said, yeah, it's real, but I never thought she'd follow up on it. <laughs> I never thought that he would respond. And so we set a date uh, to have coffee. 
and that was the beginning of this amazing journey. I remember walking in just, just being very nervous. I had no idea what to expect, none at all. Well, you know, the skeptic in me thought she would have an agenda, and she probably thought I might have an agenda. But as soon as we sat down, I thought, she doesn't have an agenda. She just wants to get to know who I am. And that really compelled me to say, I should want to get to know who she is. I think when people have the courage to show you who they are, uh, something happens. And so what surprised me about Bob was his humanity. Uh, he's an incredible dad. I also found him to be really funny, and I didn't expect that at all. But we laugh, we laugh a lot. Uh, Donna's a very good person. She's a passionate person. Uh, she has advocated for her issues tirelessly uh, for over three decades. So regardless if I agree or disagree with her on the issues, I have a tremendous respect for her. For a long time, I've been really tired of the hate and the aggression and the kind of snarkiness. We can disagree without being disagreeable. We can fight the good fight in the court of public opinion, but we don't have to hurt each other. That's, I think, the big takeaway for me. We don't have to hurt each other, because when we do that, we're hurting ourselves. We get coffee about once every couple of months. And I think with Donna, her and I readily assessed uh, that we have a lot of common interest. Uh, we have some common ground. The only regret in all of that is that I wasn't the one to ask her out for coffee. Uh, and she's the one who asked me out. And I'm glad she did, but I kind of feel like I should have. What surprised me was not that he liked me. I thought, yeah, he'd like me. What surprised me was I really liked him. It hasn't changed my beliefs. Uh, it, may have, it may have changed my approach because when we do put out a press release, when we do make a public statement, uh, many times I think, I wonder how Donna will view this. Here's the deal. If Bob and I can have coffee, if we can tell stories and laugh and get to know each other, if we can like each other, then I think almost anyone can find that person in their life and maybe they can reach out their hand and invite them in. So we actually use this video in our training with state legislators. And I'm not kidding when I say just the act of watching it opens up a different possibility. I'm going to take a little bit of time to do really brief, but to give you a taste. Obviously, you didn't come here with someone different than you. But take a minute and just think of someone in your life that you have a rift with about the political situation we're in, a real person, that your relationship with them has changed as a result of where we are. And spend a couple minutes thinking just to yourself about what would be the risk and what would be the reward of trying to have a conversation like this? And some of you will already know someone in your life you just know there's no point in trying this with. So don't pick that person, obviously. But pick a real one and spend just a couple minutes. What would be the risk and what would be the reward? Get that clear in your brains, OK? Really quickly. So did one of you get far enough in the conversation to have the experience of getting a new idea? Anybody get that far? Looks like a few of you did. OK, I apologize for not giving you enough time to do what I know can be an important experience. I'm going to share just a couple more things. Um, this, do take a note. Well, actually, you're gonna, you can get these slides from George. He'll put them out. We created a texting platform that connects texting with a small group discussion and linked to social media when we were asked by the Obama administration to be the lead on a community-based national discussion on mental health. In about 15 months, 80,000 young people in this country between the ages of 13 and 24, that was called Text Talk Act, used that platform. We know it prevented some suicides, SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Administration, put out another $5 million for the mental health first aid program to be trained to teachers, parents, and students. So we saw it work, particularly with young people. 
We've used it now in four or five other issues. Now we've rewritten it to be text talk revive civility. All you have to do is go to 89800 on your phone, text that number, and then text civility in the message line. And the genius of it is the phone becomes the facilitator. It's neutral, it can't be argued with, it doesn't argue with you. But teachers, this has now been used in about 4,000 classrooms across the country. Uh, anyway, it's a great <coughs> tool that, and we do webinar training. Like if you wanted to bring this to an organization, we do a webinar training so you could be running it yourself. Um, four elements to our initiative. Civility pledge, civility conversations, mayoral proclamations, and citizen action. We hope you will actually go to that website or our organization website and sign the civility pledge yourself. We've committed to our funders that we will have 100,000 people in each of those four states that have signed this by November. So, and, and frankly, it counts from every other state too, but the standard was set for those four states. I'm going to quickly, I wanted to give a couple of signs of hope in the media world. Uh, you've heard so much about this today. Jan, I would call this like a third generation, they now call it citizen-centered journalism. This is in Ohio. Our organization brought together elected officials, journalists, and the public in 2015 about how the 2016 campaign was going to operate. And out of that, 14 outlets decided to cover it not as a horse race, but to force the candidates to respond to the citizens' real concerns about jobs, immigration, et cetera. This was so effective that Doug Opplinger, who was then the lead publisher, editor of the Akron Beacon Journal, has left his position, is financed to actually take this statewide. They're now up to 27 outlets that are doing this. Go to the website, Your Voice Ohio. You'll find it very interesting. This one, I, we just recently discovered, and I think it's a great example of how young people who are serious journalists and who really want to do scale and do it online as their start place. The outlet is called Spaceship Media. After the um, election, they randomly selected 100 Alabama women who voted for Trump and 100 Californian women who voted for Hillary. And you can imagine what they learned about stereotypes very quickly. It, got, it was well moderated. This is up on the web. Although they don't give you access to a lot of the actual conversations, which I'm sure you understand why. But the women involved in the project were so intrigued and got so engaged with each other that they asked to meet face to face. And they are now working to build up a larger effort on this in 2018, and the way we're supporting them is helping them find the facilitators who are capable of moderating those kinds of very tough conversations online, which is in some ways harder than it is face to face. Okay, what can you do? As I said, sign the civility pledge, and I'm going to in one minute talk to you about, we learned so much about how we did this at Thanksgiving and Christmas and Hanukkah, which we called setting the table for civility that we wanted to replicate it to see if we could take it to scale. And what we've chosen um, is a National Week of Conversation, which is going to happen between April 20th to the 28th. There are 16 other organizations that do deliberative democracy kind of work or talking across the divide that are also pushing this out. There will be three or four themes that Americans can agree to choose to be part of. The particular one that we want to engage people, this at first was a surprise to me, but maybe it shouldn't have been. As we were out really in communities, what we began to hear is Americans really think that the 2018 election is going to be worse than the 2016 election. That's their expectation. So the topic that we've chosen is what can the public what can journalists and what can candidates and campaign people do to change the tone of the 2018 election? And we pulled together a brain trust, people like Tom Daschle, Olympia Snow, a lot of state legislators, some mayors. They are the brain trust that is working with us to idea brainstorm about these are actual things that maybe people could do that would make a difference. So, well, I 
I said this already. And up on our, it's, this is up on the www.revivecivility.org website already. Five key questions. We're strongly recommending you do this one-on-one. -on -one. I think at this point we have signed on 12 of the largest religious institutions in the United States to be our partners of this. It's one of the few infrastructures in the country that is in every community where people come together. So we decided to use faith-based organizations as our primary distribution channel. Then what we've done, and this is harder, and some of you could probably help, we are working to sign up media outlets and elected officials who agree ahead of time to actually take the stories that come out of this and use them. It's like you were saying, it's smaller audiences, get real stories to them, and any of you who wanted to help us introduce us to particularly media outlets, we would love the help. So please do sign up at www.revivecivility.org, download a sample conversation guide, invite one person to join you, meet sometime during that week. I was just in South Carolina and the, this big Presbyterian network wants to do this, but they want to do it outside of the week. We said, no worries, just do it, we'll still get it up there. <laughs> okay, share your ideas afterwards. I'm going to close with two quotes. Um, I found this one recently. Eleanor Roosevelt, when she was working on the human rights campaign in the United Nations, or the human rights declaration in the United Nations, when this quote happened. We have to face the fact that either all of us are going to die together, or we're going to learn to live together. And if we're going to live together, we'll have to talk. If I were going to be so audacious as to edit her slightly, I would say, We'll have to talk and listen. And never doubt that a small group of small, thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Of course, there have to be thousands of those small, committed group of citizens. You guys have been great. I think I've overstayed my time. But thank you, thank you, thank you. And thank you for inviting me.